Uh, I'm immensely grateful to Verity for stepping to give that such short notice. In fact, um, within about an hour and a half of emailing, I had two offers. Uh, Verity got in just before Klaus, and it made me think, actually, in terms of organizing seminars, why do it over a month in advance, just to say, you know, five minutes before, and then people are eager enough. Um, and what I'm particularly pleased with me is that for a while in the department, we, we wanted to have um, seminars which weren't the finished product, but where people were doing things in progress, and the aim was to help people move their research on. And, and the reason why uh, Verity um, uh, volunteered is because next week she's going down to a really <coughs> university in Cambridge to give this talk. So she thought she would try it out on ours, which has two implications. First of all, it's a work in progress. It's not entirely finished. In fact, she was working on it two minutes ago. And secondly, this will please the rock violence in the room, she said she would welcome critique. She would welcome critique, but hopefully constructive critique to move things on. So I hope uh, this will be uh, uh, very useful for us. I also hope Verity will be uh, useful for you. But as I say, I hope it can be a genuine uh, conversation and constructive ideas and critique at the end, I think will be, I'm putting words in your mouth, but will be gratefully received. Very much so. So thank you very much for um, the very short notice invitation. I was just saying to Steve, it, it is actually very helpful to have been forced to do this now, because otherwise I would have found myself being this unprepared in a week's time, which would have made me very nervous. But this way, I, I do hope that you'll give me feedback on the talk and I'll be able to make, a, make it better for next week. <laughs> Um, so this is my title, Thinking Flexibly and Enhancing Cognition. Um, what the talk's actually about is that just about every psychiatric illness and also most neurological conditions involve impairments in cognition. And furthermore, cognitive impairment is positively correlated, well, the severity of the cognitive impairment is correlated with poor prognosis, it's bad outcomes. So if we could only find a way to improve cognition, Quite apart from all the other symptoms of neurological and psychiatric illness, if we could improve the cognition, we would be able to improve the prognosis for people with those conditions. So that's really what's motivating this talk. Because then behind it, the, the other issue then is, is how do you do that? Because okay, it sounds kind of, kind of straightforward and simple, really. So you can work with a pharmaceutical company, and that's, that's great. And then they say to you, OK, so how are we going to do that? How do we develop a drug? What is it actually that we're trying to enhance? So. If, if we knew what we were trying to enhance, that would be a good first start. So to, to find out what we did is we're trying to enhance, we then have to really understand the cognitions. And so that's really the first place I'm coming from. So in this talk, you will see brain lesions and you will see pharmacology and drugs being given. But actually, I'm not going to show... I think I've got one cross-section of a brain. I'm not going to show you m many brains and I'm not going to show you many circuit diagrams because it's really not about the particular bit of the brain that's sort of missing the point. It's really about the architecture of the cognition, and we get at the architecture of the cognition, one of the ways we do that is by looking at the architecture of the brain, and by interfering in that, we can disrupt bits of the cognition. So that's really where the neuroanatomy bits come in, and so you don't need to worry about that. But really, it's the cognition I'm interested in primarily. OK, what's, what, which cognition? So. Essentially, when, when we're talking about psychiatric illnesses and the neurological illnesses, the kind of cognitions that really bother people aren't the things like, can you still do maths? I mean, heck, could you ever? That doesn't really matter. It's more, it's these executive processes. So, for example, directed attention and attentional filtering. Well, this is really important because being able to direct your attention means that you, can, you filter information so that you can process relevant information, and you don't process, you inhibit irrelevant information. So just imagine going into a supermarket, and on your shopping list is Weetabix, and you see those honey loops. And you were, no, Weetabix, that's what you were here for, wasn't it? Or was it orange juice? It was something to do with breakfast, wasn't it? And suddenly it all falls apart. This is one of the reasons why the prognosis is poor. It's actually activities of daily life that completely fall apart if you can't even manage to select something from a stimulus array like a supermarket shelf. Working memory. Okay, this is not, I'm not actually making definitions. I'm deliberately not making a definition of working memory. I'm telling you sort of what I'm talking about because you'll see the overlap in this directed attention, attentional filtering, and also the def what I'm just about to say about working memory. So 
when we talk about working memory, I'm not really talking about whether you can remember a telephone number while you dial it, right? That's not such a big deal. You can always point to the telephone book as you dial. Yeah, that's not debilitating. What's debilitating is the kind of working memory that keeps that what's what thing going on. So I'm in the supermarket. What am I here for? Was it breakfast? No. That kind of working memory. So it keeps you on task, also enables you to process and filter the information. So do I want 28 Weetabix or do I want 48? Oh, they don't sell 28. What do they sell 28 of? Is it eggs? Was that what I was here for? Right. So that if you can't keep a, even a train of consciousness and manipulate the relevant information in your head a, as you're going along. Okay. And then we've got flexibility. So people talk about flexibility a lot in my area anyway. It's about being able to shift your attention when goals change. So when you change your mind about something, do you know what? I don't even like Weetabix. Let's go with the honey loops. It's fine. You can have a new goal. You also need to change your behavior in response to feedback. So now the fire alarm's going off. Is the Weetabix that important or should you just evacuate at this point? So an external stimulus can change what it is you need to be doing. And so you need to be flexible in your behavior and not rigidly say, I'm here to buy Weetabix and goddamn I'll buy Weetabix. Okay. And they're having insight into all of the problems that, that are going on. So if you don't know that you've got a problem, then blissful though that may be, it's a pretty poor prognosis for everyday life. Okay, so that's what I'm about. But specifically then, we study in my lab, we study set shifting. And set shifting actually encompasses all of those executive processes that I've just mentioned. So although I didn't define them specifically, in some sense, they all come into these kinds of tasks that I'm talking about. They're epitomised by the Wisconsin card sort test, which I'm hoping that most of you already know about. This is where um, the patient or the, the participant is given a deck of cards and just asked to simply sort them into piles and the experimenter will tell you if you're getting it correct. And the cards differ by the stimuli that are on them in their colour or the, or the shapes and the number of stimuli. And the idea is that the person sorts into piles for example, to an un unknown rule, they have to guess the rule, but say they're sorting by colour into these different piles, in which case this stimulus obviously goes onto the purple pile if they're sorting by colour. And then suddenly they're told, no, that's not correct. So you now have got an external stimulus that's requiring that you change your behaviour, so you have to be flexible. And so you have to guess again, so you go, well, maybe it's the shape. So you try that, no, that's not correct either. It's like, oh, could it be this one? It's like, what the heck? You're not even on task. <laughs> so it's this one, okay. So, so by trial and error, and by having the, this, this catch pile, there's always a catch pile, so you make sure that you can rule out the person's really not doing the task properly at all, and you watch how flexibly they can solve these tasks. So these stimuli all have in common that they're multidimensional. Okay? So by that I mean, let's focus on the letters first. The letters differ in several different respects. They're both letters, obviously, we got that. So they have in common their letters, but this is a red letter and this is a green letter. This is a capital and this is a lowercase. This, is the letter, this, this letter is a vowel and this letter is a consonant. Some of those differences I've described are conceptual differences. So vowel and, const, vowel and consonant have nothing to do with the, not to say have nothing to do with the physical properties, but clearly they do because you're reading them. But it's a conceptual distinction that you've learned between these letters. But the others, like the colour, is a physical, visual property of the stimulus. And if you're red, green, blind, you've got a problem. But I don't need to notice that, I'll change the colours of those. Anyway, right, so this, this is also, also multidimensional stimuli, but the dimensions here are, are sort of um, kind of, well, we've got shape, and the background is the purple shape, and these superimposed lines. Now, the, the, there's a very particular reason why, I'll tell you why this, I'm not going to tell them because they know why, in Cambridge they know why these are like this. These are like this because marmoset monkeys are colour blind, and in trying to find visual stimuli that had multi-dimensional dimensions for use in marmosets, and you couldn't use colour, and you can't use numerosity, so you're starting to run out of things you can use. They don't know about vowels and consonants. So what else are you going to use? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You're going to use shapes and lines. So what the, um, what the marmoset monkey learns is that either, for example, this line is, is the correct stimulus, and the shape behind it is irrelevant, or this line might be, or this shape might be, and the line in front is irrelevant. And obviously the line can be paired with either shape, just like the A could be green or red and the B could be green or red. Okay? So the multidimensionality of the stimuli enable, to, enable you to change the stimuli so that you can find out 
what the person is responding to in much the same way as the card sorting was, was done. So you know if they put the card onto the green pile, they're sorting by colour. So here, if they select this, you don't know immediately they're selecting a green, but if they then choose the green A on the next trial, then they're selecting by green. Okay. So this, these are stimuli just specifically designed for monkeys, but of course humans can do this task as well and do. Rats have pretty poor vision. They're not blind. They can do visual tasks, but they're not particularly good at it. Also, they're not particularly grand with computers. You know, some people, I'm not going to say that in Cambridge either, because they think they are, because they have touch screens and they try and tra train rats to use touch screen computers, but we're leaving that aside, uh, we don't do that. We do what rats like to do. We let all, all of the tasks I'm talking about today are spontaneous behaviours. So the rats are working for sweet cereals that they, that they like, um, it's all self-paced, we don't make them do anything. And they spontaneously dig in these bowls, and we can bury a piece of cereal in the bowls. And you'll see that the bowls are multidimensional, so they, they look different. Now, I said that rats aren't very visual, and they're not, so actually we don't use what the bowl looks like, but we potentially can. We have done black and white. Mainly what we use, because it works, is the digging media. So this is gravel, and this is sawdust. And when the rat digs, it can feel that it's digging in something different. Okay, so you can either teach the animal to make a distinction between the, the, what it's digging in, and you can also scent the digging media. So you can, you can have the animal, they're very, very um, olfactory, rats are. So all of this foraging behaviour, they forage using their nose, and they forage in materials. Okay, so it's all very spontaneous behaviour. So this is what we do. This is called the intradimensional, extradimensional task. And for the rats, the rat stays in this part of the box, and he's held in the, so you don't handle him during the test, there's lids down, and there's a partition in here. And you bait one of these bowls, and then you remove the partition, and the animal can go and sniff around, and then sniff around this one, and go back and choose in the one he wants to dig in. And so you can give them a series of two choice discriminations, where you change the bowls, um, and you change the kind of stimuli and the smell, and they learn a series of discriminations. So here's an example. So first of all, you give them something very simple to learn. This is a very simple odour discrimination where cinnamon is the correct one and, and cumin, the, 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 the bait will never be hidden in the cumin bowl. And both bowls are filled with sawdust. <laughs> and the rat, you lift up the barrier and the rat approaches and gets it correct. Right? Now, obviously, on the first trial, it's 50%. That's, it'll be a lucky guess. Right? But they are so good at this that they can do this in about six or eight trials. Right, so the first trial is always a lucky guess, so on average, perfect performance would be 6.5 trials on average. Okay? And we find they're doing it in seven or eight trials, so they're pretty good at this. Okay, so they do this a while, and then when they're good at that, you then, give them, uh, then you introduce the, the other dimension, an irrelevant dimension. So here, it's uh, coarse tea, whoop, 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 sorry. coarse tea or fine tea, um, but the odour is the same, it's still cinnamon, no, oh, that's a reverse line, there you go. There we go, compound. So it's still cinnamon. So the rat comes in and gets it cor correct because he's learnt it's cinnamon, so he's paying attention to cinnamon, so actually he's not really particularly phased when you introduce the irrelevant dimension. He's he continues responding to cinnamon. When he's got that, um, we have a criterion performance of six correct choices in a row, we move on to the next stage, and the next stage is a reversal. So having learnt that cinnamon is correct, now we make cumin the correct stimulus. And... What does the rat do? Well, obviously, on the first trial, it goes to the cinnamon because it doesn't know that you changed anything. Okay, so it doesn't know it reached a criteria and all it's doing is digging in the bowls and cinnamon was correct and has been correct for the last so many trials. And so now you change the rule. So it's a little bit like the experimenter changing the Wisconsin card sort rule. Okay, the person doesn't know at first and so will continue to sort according to the old rule until they get the feedback and figure it out. And that's what the rats do. So there will always be a reversal cost. There has to be a reversal cost of at least one trial because the rat didn't know you changed anything. So if, as long as it's performing, it doesn't have any clue that anything's changed. So the, there must be a one trial cost. But often there's several more trials on a reversal. Okay, then... You change all the stimuli, so new odours and new digging media, and the animal has to learn a new discrimination. And paprika, so we're still on odour, the animal's still learning odours, so it's called an intradimensional, so it's within the same dimension, and the dimension is odour. And the animal's learnt that odour's important, and it's done this now for three stages, and so now it's got a new odour, and it's paprika, and 
lucky guess. Didn't have to be on the first trial, it was a random guess because it really doesn't know, but makes a lucky guess it's paprika, and again, goes through this fairly quickly. We do another reversal of that one, and then we give a new set of stimuli, now it's coarse shavings and nutmeg, and fine shavings and cloves. But this time, this is extra dimensional, so it requires a shift of attention, because odour is no longer going to be the important dimension. Now the animal has to pay attention to what it's digging in and not what it smells like. So on the first trial, he makes a lucky guess. Didn't have to have done that, could have been incorrect, whatever. He's made a lucky guess. Fine shavings it is. Right. But remember, he thinks it's the smell. So on trial two, chances are he's going to go for the cloves because that's what he just got correct, okay? because he's paying attention to odour. So the way the extra dimensional shift works is if the animal does not pay attention to the smell, then all you can conclude is that it has not formed an attentional set. But if the animal has formed an attentional set, then at this crucial stage, you will make behaviour, I don't want to use the word impaired, but you will make it more difficult for the animal to acquire this new discrimination because what it needs to do is shift its attention away from that reliable smell that always told it where the food was onto what it's digging in. Now, of course, we counterbalance that, so sometimes we're, we're training them to dig first, the, the mid mediums, <laughs> and then we move them onto the odour. So it's all, all of that's counterbalanced. OK, so on trial two, he gets it wrong, and so on. So in the standard task, the standard seven-stage task, we have new learning, the, S, the simple discrimination. Then we introduce the irrelevant dimension, the compound discrimination. We have a reversal of the same stimuli. We have new stimuli for an interdimensional shift, the same dimension relevant. Then we have another reversal, lots of reversals, and then the crucial ED stage with new stimuli where the relevant dimension changes. And then finally a reversal. Okay, so that's the standard task and you'll, you'll meet this task quite a few times. Okay, this is data from a marmoset doing that standard task. Okay. And I want to show you three things. So first of all, this is the performance at the intradimensional shift. And this is the errors to criterion. And so at the interdimensional shift, <coughs> this is C is control. LAT stands for the lateral prefrontal cortex. And ORB stands for the orbital prefrontal cortex. That's not important, really. They just think of them as being the, th the three brain areas. Well, no, two brain areas. Okay. Right, so the, the interdimensional shift, which is new learning, new stimulus with a familiar dimension, okay, is performed pretty quickly. So no more than 10 errors before they're doing it. Monkeys aren't as good as rats. We'll come back to that in a minute. But these are the errors they're making. This is the extra-dimensional shift. And what I'm showing you on this graph is a double dissociation, where this lesion, the lat damage to cortex, produces a large deficit at the extra-dimensional shift <coughs> stage of the task. So the animal is having trouble shifting its attentional focus from the previous shapes or lines to the other new dimension, shapes or lines. But the Orbital lesion is no different from control, so there's no impairment with the orbital lesion. But on reversal stages, the lateral lesion is not impaired at all, but the orbital lesion has a big impairment. So this is a double dissociation, and in psychology we like double dissociations, because if you can say this does this and something else does that, you know, it, it, it tells you that these two processes are, are separable and separate and everything, so, so it's very good, so what do we do? We do the same experiment in the rat, and we can go, ta-da! Okay, so we have the same double dissociation where this is a, the EDS, the PL lesion impairs the extra-dimensional shift but doesn't affect the reversals at all. So they're having trouble shifting their attention, but they can respond flexibly, so they can change their responding on a reversal learning, but they can't shift their attention. Whereas on the reversal learning, the orbital lesion is impaired and is not on the EDS. Okay. So that's very nice. Okay, because it's another dis double dissociation and we like those, but it's also very nice because of the similarity of these two. Because one of the things we're trying to do is convince people that we're looking at the same behaviours. Because if you're looking at the same behaviours in a rat and in a monkey, as you see in, in people, then that provides you with a model and this is a way we can move forward with pharmacology and we can do testing in animals that we couldn't do in people, necessarily. Okay, so that's good. Now, when we published this, these data, um, qu quite a long time ago now, actually, um, 
there's a Kerry McAlonan and I, puzzled over this peculiar thing going on here. So this is the classic extra dimensional shift effect. So this is the cost of shifting set that you see in the control animals. So IDS, the intradimensional shift, is learned faster than the extra dimensional shift. And you sort of you need that because without that, you don't really know what the animal's doing. You don't know they formed a set at all. The problem was, was that in our orbital rats, that wasn't statistically significant. Now, you said, well, okay, that's not a problem. That's interesting. Well, it was, it was a problem. It was a statistical problem at this in, in 2003. It was a statistical problem because it also wasn't statistically not significant, if you see what I mean. So that interaction wasn't significant, which meant that we couldn't actually break down the groups. Right? So this difference between control and orbital is not significant. So although that difference is not significant, because the interaction is not significant, legitimately you can't look at that. Okay. So it was a bit of a head scratch. We were very reluctant to say that ED shifting was unimpaired because we didn't know what ED shifting was doing because we weren't convinced that the animals had actually formed a set. But at the same time, we couldn't say they hadn't formed a set because of the statistics of it. So a while later, we decided we would revisit it. And the other, the other thing I should point out as well is that this... I thought was quite exciting because it looked to me like maybe, just maybe. So I asked um, Trevor to go back and look at his data and tell me if that was anything. And he came back and said, absolutely spot on, nothing. Right? There's nothing in the marmoset data. You don't see this, you don't see this effect. So then that's a, that's a big head scratch as well. So this is, this is starting to worry me because you know, it's one of those niggles that you start having. Them. Like, are they different? What's going on? Is it just a fluke or chance? Is it nothing? So we decided we, we had to replicate it. So we replicated it. And we replicated, first of all, the, the all three reversals. Right? So remember, so these, are, these are the stages of the test. Simple compound, a reversal, intradimensional shift, a reversal, extra dimensional shift, and another reversal. And you can see that this is the reversal cost. And you see it in the controls. This is the ED cost. That's the ID and the ED. That's the third reversal. And <coughs> on all three reversals, the orbital lesioned animals are impaired, and that's exactly what we saw before. So that's a very reliable. We know that. We believe that. But this is now statistically significant. And it, that most definitely is as well. So now we start being convinced that we're actually seeing something going on here, that these reversal deficits, we're not quite sure anymore whether we can claim they're actually a double dissociation between the extra dimensional deficit and the reversal deficits, because if the animals with the reversal impairment aren't forming a set, then actually we have no information about whether they can or cannot shift it. So we decided to set about trying to make them form a set. So how do you do that? Well, Practice, 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 we thought. So this is the solution. The standard seven-stage tests between the ID and the ED, there's only so there's one, two, three, four acquisition stages, well, five if you include that reversal, and then the ED. So we thought, well, if we, like, first of all, maybe, maybe the reversals, the fact that reversal learning is impaired, maybe that's somehow interfering with the, maybe that impairment is somehow interfering. So if we get rid, if we lose the reversals, and instead of doing reversal stages, just insert lots and lots of ID stages. So that by the time the animal gets to here, it's done four IDs plus the CD and the SD. So it's actually six stages before it gets to the ED. And we thought, well, maybe that might, be, that might help them form a set. Right, so on this next graph, I'm showing you here, SD, CD, and these are the four IDs. This is the ED. And the open bars are the controls. And what you see is, with the missing reversal, the ID is a little bit higher than we would normally expect to see. But immediately the second ID comes down, so that by the time the fourth ID is here, there's a nice ID ED difference. In our lesioned animals, they're slower to learn to form the set. Okay? But by the fourth ID, they're there. And then what happens is this interaction is significant. So in fact, they have a set shifting impairment once they've learned to form a set. So this got us to thinking then, there's something about reversals and set formation that needs to be looked at. So then, then, 
I thought, you're going to think, <laughs> I've just had a funny thought, you're going to think that I've got a cupboard full of unpublished data. And it turns out I've got a cupboard full of unpublished data. And the reason I have a cupboard full of unpublished data is that when you find something, you're going to say, I have no idea what that means. Right. And so when I looked at this, I thought to myself, that reminds me of another set of data that I have no idea what it means. And that's this data. Because a long time previously, when Janice Phillips and Andy Blackwell, really, this is a very long time ago, were in the lab, we made lesions of the subthalamic nucleus. And, we've, and th this was actually a control experiment. This, th there's, no, there's no rationale for doing this experiment, actually, like this. It was a, this was a control group for an entirely other experiment, which if you're interested, I'd go into. But this is what the animals did. So this is a standard seventh stage task, and the black lines are the controls, and here's the reversal cost. Yeah, so reversals are longer than CVs. This is the ID, this is the ED, a nice big ED, ID effect. And these are the reversals. And the lesioned animals just sort of took a while to get into the hang of it. And they were just making lots and lots and lots and lots of errors. And then they seemed to get it. But no IDED difference. So I thought, well, OK, so what's the relationship between these impairments, that, you know, what's going on here, and what our orbital animals are doing? So is it something about, so we know it's, you know, is it something to do with the fact that this reversal's impaired, that they're not forming set? So we went back to our trusty method with the four IDs and thinking, well, if it worked for the orbitals, maybe we can get the <laughs> subthalamic nucleus guys to form set. So we decided to replicate. So we start off replicating. Oh, no, I should say, OK, I will tell you about why the interest in the STM. So why do we even do that experiment? Okay. There is an overall interest in the basal ganglia and movement control and cognition. And that's because inactivation of the subthalamic nucleus is a treatment for Parkinson's disease. Okay. So some of you may have seen online the videos where patients have stimulators, deep brain stimulation, and they can control them with a wand that's implanted under the skin. And, and the patient can turn their stimulator on and off. And so a patient with a classic cogwheel tremor um, at rest, we sit there tremoring away, and then we'll activate activate the stimulation and, and after a few seconds suddenly the tremor stops and the patient sits there at rest and will get up out of their chair and will be able to walk fluently but then if they turn the stimulator off again they begin immediately tremoring and, and, and have to sit down again so it's a very very powerful effect but of course as we know we need to know what inactivation actually does it's all very well to say that it oh that, that's the Hippocratic Oath by the way which is first do no harm so we know that it's effective for treating the motor symptoms of the disease. But I was interested at this time in, is it effective also for treating the cognitive symptoms? So we know that, that Parkinson's disease is associated with cognitive impairment, in particular, include, and including set shifting impairments. So that was one interesting thing. But the second thing is, is does damaging the STN per se cause cognitive impairment? Because if it does, then you might wonder whether that would be, you know, you might want to refine the treatment or, you know, think about the treatment. So there are two reasons to be interested in cognition and the subthalamic nucleus. One is, can you repair the cognition impairments in Parkinson's disease? And the second is, do you cause any more by disrupting the STN? So that's why we were interested in it. So I'll just very briefly tell you, we made um, Parkinsonian-like dopamine depletion lesions of the striatum to make them a Parkinsonian model. We saw behavioural impairments, we saw reaction time impairments, we saw movement impairments, and we saw cognitive impairments. So then we made a combined damage of the STN and the, six, and the um, striatum, Parkinsonian model, and hallelujah, deficit goes away. Right, this is really good news for us, except for that pesky problem that the control lesion that was supposed to do nothing was the STN lesion, and it did that strange thing. And the reviewers came back and said about the paper, well, until you can explain why a downstream structure, which is what the S10 is, you know, it's an output structure, which is why closing it off blocks the overactivity caused by Parkinson's disease. So it's like, when you can explain why a downstream structure causes a deficit, which the combined lesion doesn't have, then then we'll take your paper. So we, ha we still haven't answered that. We've actually been working on it for quite a while, still working on that one. Haven't answered that one, so we've returned to the STN. So this is the thing about the STN, you see. 
So I, I'm, this is the only circuit diagram I'm showing. It's a quick one. This is cortex, and this is thalamus, okay? and, and it's loopy. That's the main point. So you've got these two pathways. You've got something what's called in the literature the hyperdirect pathway, where there's a cortical projection directly to the STN and out to the globus pallidus and thalamus and then the motor system. Then you've got this other pathway, which is via the stratum. Right, so the fact you've got these two pathways means that, well, basically it's complicated. Okay, so then, I won't do that. Right, so this is our replication of the first experiment. And again, we find, so these, right, so remember in that last experiment, we saw impairments at all these early stages. Well, here we don't, but that's because we test them slightly differently. So these rats were tested repeatedly and this is on their third test, what we're seeing here is the black lines are control with a nice EDID difference and the STN rats have not formed set. And this is despite <coughs> several, several tests and repeated tests and they're not forming set. So we turn to the four ID task and this is what we find. This is the, these are the four IDs and stubbornly they still haven't formed set. Okay. So that didn't do it either. And what's interesting to me at this point is apart from not forming set, they don't look very impaired. <laughs> okay, so everything else looks <coughs> pretty much as you might expect it to be, apart from ID4, but that doesn't look too bad, and that doesn't look too bad. So just start thinking, well, do you need set? Well, what, what do you need it for? So we confirmed there was no benefit of repeated ID learning and no cost of an ED shift. So we're trying to find out why, what exactly is going on. So, so examining the psychological processes, what could be going on here. So we know that the ID effect, so that's when ID comes down with repeated testing, is due to getting a set, so focusing your attention on the relevant aspects of the stimuli. And we also know that the ED effect depends upon prior reinforcement history. Let me just explain that. Okay. If you don't remember what came before, then it doesn't really matter, does it? So think about HM, about those amnestics. Well, HM's not going to form a set because as soon as you put him a distraction, he's going to just take new learning and be all over again. You know, because you can only form a set if your prior reinforcement history is, is influencing your, the, the next stage. If you like. So perhaps it's not that they, well, they're not forming set, obviously, and that's very, very clear. But maybe just saying forming set is sort of missing. We need, maybe we need to unpack it a little bit. And perhaps what's happening is that each time you do something, each time something new and different happens, maybe it just sort of like resets the animal's attention. And so every, on each new stimulus presentation, the rat sort of goes, oh, something interesting is happening, and off he goes. And as if, you know, like distracting HM, that, that whatever happened previously makes no difference. So not devastatingly impaired, but just unable to benefit or, or have a cost of prior reinforcement history. So we were interested in trying to tease apart, could we find out whether it's something to do with not being able to get an attentional focus or whether it's more to do with just being able to lose it so very quickly that you could even see this as being a kind of cognitive enhancement. Well, this is the genuine thinking outside of a box that because you're the ultimate flexible person. Right. So we designed a new task called the 11 stage task with hatched 11 stages. It has a, we start off, okay, so we start off much as ever, so CD and new exemplars at the first ID. Right, then we have a second ID, and the hypothesis here is that if new exemplars somehow reset you, you so that it causes distraction and forgetting and, and somehow your past, your reinforcement history is no longer relevant, then at the first reversal, which is actually going to be a reversal of the ID1 stimuli, so the question is, is, will the rats remember the reinforced stimuli from two stages ago? Because if this somehow resets everything, then you wouldn't see a reversal cost when you reverse the ID1. Okay, so then we'll do a few more IDs just for good measure. And then we'll really test the memory hypothesis by doing a reversal of ID2. So now we've got four intervening stages. So the question is, will the rats remember reinforced stimuli from four stages ago. And we thought that's a pretty strong test because, you know, here you could go, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. But this is lots of intervening stimuli. So that's a good test of the forgetting hypothesis. So then we go on to... So now we're on set seven stages. And will a set have formed after seven stages? And then we do a probe test. Now, the purpose of the probe test is 
the significant stimuli, the positive, the rewarded stimuli, is not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is the irrelevance, so the background stimuli, the irrelevant dimension. We're going to introduce new stimuli at this stage. And of course, nothing else will change. So the rat just now, all it has to do is carry on doing what it was doing before. The stimulus is still correct, but the background stimuli, and the question is, are we going, is this going to be disruptive or cause a distraction? And then finally, the ED. If by this stage, after this is like 10 stages in, if a set has formed, now we want to know, well, is it, is it going to be normal? And then we're going to finish off with an SD, with a simple discrimination, just to check that after 11 stages, we haven't exhausted the animal who's just basically given up. Okay, so this is to just to make sure that they're still on task and they're still with us. Okay, so that's the 11 stage task. So what I'm showing you here is controlled data, first of all. So this is the normal rats. Okay, and this up the side, of it's trials to criterion, and this line shows you criterion performance. Right, so that's the minimum of number of trials that the rat has to do before we say it's learnt it. Of course, it could have learnt it before then, but it has to do six trials before it's determined. Right, um, that's the compound discrimination to begin with. The royal blue bars are the IDs. The dark blue bars are the reversals. That's the probe. And this is the ED. So what you can see here on this graph then is that's the reversal cost. And as you can see, the magnitude of the reversal cost is exactly the same, even if there's an intervening stage, there's a reversal cost. Or if there's all these intervening stages, so this is the reversal cost of reversing this. So if this rat had not remembered that it had ever seen those stimuli, then you would expect this to be down here. You'd expect it to be learned just as quickly as when it learnt the other you know, so, so remember, when it learnt here, it learnt stimulus A was positive. Now it's going to have to learn that stimulus B is positive. But clearly, because there's a cost, that tells us that the animal <coughs> remembers that A was positive and used to be positive. And so it's responding to A and therefore making these errors. So that's the reversals. And that's the shift cost. So this is the intradimensional learning and then the extradimensional learning. And that's the additional trials required to learn the extra dimensional thing. Importantly is this one. So this is the probe. So what tells us here is if the animal here is responding to stimulus X, when the probe trials, the background stimuli change, but stimulus X is still correct. And as you can see, the rat just goes trucking on straight along, not phased by that at all, because it's formed a set. So because it's focused on the smell, whatever, it's completely oblivious to the fact that something in the background has changed. Okay, now look at the STN data. Whoa. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, there's no shift cost. It hasn't formed a set. Okay, so it didn't form a set before and it still hasn't formed a set. There's also no reversal cost either. Okay. You'll also see that the trials are very elevated here at the beginning and sort of drift generally downwards, but then that is the easiest thing. But by and large, so, so now I'm going to show you it the same... The data from the last two slides, I'm going to put it together so you can look at where the differences are between the two groups. Okay, and I'll, but I'll talk to you, it looks cluttered, okay, but I'm going to break it down. Okay, so the um, white lines are the controls, grey lines are the lesioned animals. And what I want you to notice is these are the five ID stages, okay, and right, those are the, oops, sorry, we'll go back in. Right, so those, the first three, are statistically significantly impaired. This is not statistically significant. Okay. Um, um, well, I don't know why. It's not. But you can see generally that's what we're going on. There's no set formed. Okay. So the control animals have an IDED difference, and the lesion animals do not. That's the IDED. Whoops. And the final. Oh no. No, I don't want it. So, notwithstanding that they do not form an attentional set. I'll repeat what I said. They don't seem very impaired. Okay. So as you noticed on the... That way. Right. So the ED is not impaired. Okay. That's not a significant difference. So they're not significantly better, but not significantly worse. The two reversal stages are not impaired. So neither of those are significantly different. Okay. So they're not devastated by not being able to form a set, is my point. So what is going on? What this graph shows you is the probability of the first two trials being correct or incorrect in the first two ID stages. And this is the control. Blue is control and red is lesion. 
Now, these are the first two trials. So it's the first time it sees the stimulus. So it's a guess. The animal cannot know what's correct. So these first two trials have to be 50%. Okay? Anything other than 50% is a psychic rat. Okay? Right. And it's 50%. So that means, right, if the animal really doesn't know what it's doing, if it really has forgotten its prior stimuli, it has to be 50%. So now I'm going to show you the reversal data. And you can see the control and the lesion animals perform the reversals exactly the same. In other words, they are 90% likely to select the previously reinforced stimulus. And that's true whoops, for both the lesions and the controls. Which means that notwithstanding the fact that there was no reversal cost in the lesioned animals, there actually is a reversal cost. So actually, what's happened is not that there's no reversal cost. <laughs> it's actually that there's a, an ID problem. So, th so somehow, there seems to be an acquisition impairment. Okay. Then we've got this funny probe effect. So this is interesting because we expected the controls to do this. We've seen this before. If they're on set, they're not distracted by introducing the irrelevant dimension. When you do that to the lesioned animals, however, they treat the probe trial just exactly like the ED and the ID. They have to learn it all over again, which implies to us that what these animals are doing is somehow configural learning. So they're not learning that odour is important, and by the way, it's cinnamon. They're actually learning that cinnamon sand is baited, and so is cinnamon gravel. Right? Which isn't quite the same thing as learning it's where the cinnamon is. Forget about the gravel, forget about the sand, that's irrelevant. Okay? So what they're, not, what they're actually doing is failing to learn about irrelevancy, which is why they're distracted at the probe stage. So irrelevant things are distracting. That's irrelevant. So then we come to the, <laughs> then we come to the, um, the cognitive enhancement. Okay. So modafinil, modafinil is a very interesting drug because nobody knows what it actually does, but it's a cognitive enhancer. Um, has anybody been offered a modafinil? No, you don't have to answer that. Lots of people in <laughs> universities are offered modafinil. Okay. It's actually not that difficult, I'm told. It's not that difficult to get hold of from the internet. It's a very bad idea to take modafinil from online because you don't know what you're buying and then you end up spending a lot of money and you get caffeine or something like that, um, which is actually quite a good cognitive enhancer. Anyway, so we, so we designed to test with modafinil. Now, modafinil... Yeah, no, I'm not going to talk about modafinil. We're, we're testing it anyway. So, we, so we do, we're doing a nine-stage task. Um, the reason we do a nine-stage task, we would have liked to do the 11th stage. And then Shemang went, no, don't make me do 11 stages. Was that why? No, it took too long. Okay, so the point is, when you're, <laughs> <laughs> when you're drug testing, is that you have, to, you have to give the animal the drug at the right time so that it has the effect where you want it to have the effect. But the problem with that is, as I said before, we don't make these guys do anything. Well, I make my students do it, but, <laughs> but they can't make the rats do it. So they have to sit there and wait for the rats to get on with it, and it can take a long time. Which means if you give a drug at 9 o'clock in the morning, you'd like it and the drug going to be effective sort of 60, 90 minutes later is the, the sort of peak effect time, but the rat decides to fall asleep in the cage, then you, you've got no control over it. So what we, the way we're giving the drug, a very clever idea, was put in, we put it into jelly so that the animal eats the drug itself and it sort of comes in as part of the test. So no, no nasty injections, no forcing it down. It just, when it's eaten the jelly, it carries on doing the test. So we can, you can dose it during testing. So we do a nine-stage test so that the whole thing is compressed. It takes too long so that we can get the jelly in at the right time and make sure that we finish the testing in the active window. So the stages we chose then were ID1 and ID2, and then we decided to put in the, the reversal challenges, so <coughs> reversal of ID1 and then reversal of ID2, then another ID3, then a probe, and then the ED. So it's a shortened version of the 11 stage task, but it has the critical impaired stages. So if you remember, the critical impaired stages were the, three, uh, the first three IDs and the probe. And sure enough, these are, so this graph shows us rats that are, have taken vehicle of the gray lines and modafinil is the green lines. So these are the probe and the three ID effects. And we see the same impairment we just saw before. And 
no EDID difference, so they're not forming a set, and that's the effect of the daffinal. So it brings down each of the impaired stages statistically significant, and it produces an IDED difference. And the only thing left to say is, no, we don't know how it works. Mm -hmm. And those are the acknowledgements. Thank you very much. So my first question, I'm allowed to stop, I'm allowed to ask questions. My first question is, did I speak too fast? Put your hands up if you think I could have slowed down. Thank you, Jenny. I'm not scared of you. <laughs> okay. If you're not scared of me, put your hand up. <laughs> okay, that's good, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> good, right, any other comments or questions or thoughts or suggestions? Yeah. What's your best guess? We have one other piece of data that I didn't show because I don't <coughs> have time to draw the graph. And that is we have a, another discrimination called a, a, it's a biconditional discrimination. So what this is, this was based on the idea that, that they're doing this configural learning. We decided to teach them to, to see if they would learn to do something a normal rat finds quite hard, which is once they've formed a set, so towards the, at the end of this, you then give them a conditional, a biconditional discrimination. If it's sawdust, then choose cinnamon. If it's gravel, choose cumin. <coughs> now, that's really hard because if you're focusing on the smell, then you don't notice that that was in gravel and that was in sawdust. So, so you know, a normal rat takes a long time to learn that. The STN rats learnt that fastest of all. So they didn't have much trouble learning. So it seems to me that they're doing this, um, they're not drawing out the categories, so they're not doing this. To, that, that thing that's required one step before you can generalise, which is that you have to categorise, and I think that's what they're impaired doing. Now, one, another reason I didn't show that data, which is a bit unfortunate, is that when we did the modafinil test on the biconditional, it's not statistically significant because the control rats got better at biconditional discrimination because they'd just done one. Right. So we would have to repeat that experiment with naive animals because once they finally learned to biconditional, they can do it, which meant that when we then gave modafinil to the lesioned animals, they did get worse, but because the controls had got a bit better, there was no longer a difference between the two groups, but there also wasn't a statistically significant interaction because there was a... <coughs> so that needs repeating... Right. But I think that's our best guess as to what's going on. Um, so what that leads to is a whole new set of other experiments, I think. That's Sonny's PhD. <laughs> right. Because if that is the case, then we can start looking. So there's, there's a, a quite a big human literature. And if anybody knows anything about this, like really knows about this, it would save me reading it and come talk to me about it, about overgeneralisation and you know, uh, stimulus categorisation. So if I'm right, then they wouldn't be able to do overgeneralisation either because they don't do stimulus categorisation in the first place. So a lot, of, a lot of learning is about extrapolating from one situation to the other. And these are quite simple learning tasks in a way. I mean, they, you know, in fact, all the animal really has to learn is that there's food in the bowl and then it has to just be efficient about finding it. So it doesn't actually have to learn that the food's in the cinnamon bowl. Not really. It's just it'll be inefficient not to learn that. So they learn it just by the by, but what they're actually doing is just foraging. So I suspect we could do some more complex learning tasks and look at things like categorisation and, gen and stimulus generalisation. Don't know how you do that with odours, though. With your lesion rats, you mentioned there was an overall... Yeah. It looked like there was a down. Yeah, OK. So this is really interesting. Schwang and I disagree about this. OK. Right, so look at, look at that. Like this, so this overall, let's look at it, let's look at it in coloured ones because it's clearer. That, right, this trend going down. Right, when we first replicated the seventh stage, remember we saw, we saw that, which is no impairment at the SD, the CD, or the reversal, and then the impairment appears, right, which was not what we'd seen before which was that. Wow. Right. Now, the difference is that these rats, at this time when we were doing the experiment, we thought 
that you probably couldn't reuse, you probably couldn't test an animal twice because but you can't test a human in these tasks more than once because once you've learned, that, you know, you, you get your EDs just like that. It's not a problem. So you have to be, you have to keep thinking of new dimensions to use with humans. And we thought the rats would be like that as well. But in fact, it turns out that you can leave. How short a time do we think it is now? Probably only a day. I mean, you, so you can do repeat testing over and over again, and you see the same pattern. But when we do the four ID task, because in, in this task, in the seventh stage task, they are exposed to every stimulus is at some <coughs> every yeah every stimulus is at some point in the task rewarded, right? So there's like an equal balance of reward. But in the four ID tasks, you get ID one stimulus A. Then you get another ID two is another pair that stimulus. So stimulus B was never not rewarded. So having done the four, I'm, I'm a bit too complicated now. Like having done the four ID task, we thought, right, we, let's just equalise it all again and expose them in between the testings to all the stimuli with a reward in the bowl. So, that, so as a kind of a memory wipe. And when we did that, that's when you saw that, that second phase. And I think it's to do with that. What do you think it's to do with, Schwein? Oh, I don't think you mentioned that for the like the previous experiment, you also do the pre explosion Even if it's the first time, correct? Correct, correct. Yeah. Yes. So we're saying that maybe because of this pre explosion to all swimmers, so all swimmers, once are rewarded, that might be the reason for the SDM to show this train. So, so basically, what I, I think what I would say that's to do with is perhaps the rats, like, totally not getting the point. So as I said, they don't actually have to learn where they just have to find food. And if they aren't sort of getting, like, well, it's in the here or it's in there or, you know, somewhere it's, I'll keep looking until I find it, then you'd, until they gradually get the point again that, that they're tracking a similar. I think that's, it, that, it's, it's, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. So I was wondering if there's a link between the reverse learning stage <coughs> and the fact that you get you get configurable learning. Yeah. So I mean, if you if you just go through this, what the, the learning experience the rat has, it learns first that older one is good, and then in the reversal stage, it, it, it learns that older one is suddenly bad, not irrelevant but bad, but the other one's good. So if it's trying to explain that to itself, you know, you know, yeah. apply what they are, then the only reasonable solution would be, well, it's now good because it's going with another dimension, which is the gravel. Yeah. Do, do okay, so... If you remove the reversal phase, would you, in this whole sequence, would that still work? Yeah, so if, when you remove the reversal stages, that's like, like in the 4ID task, then you have to put in the extra IDs. But you're right, it's not just about the number of stages. The reversal stage is actually a very crucial point in the learning. So back in the day... In 1971, Sutherland and Macintosh came up with a theory of attentional of, of learning and attention, which basically <coughs> says so. So there's a, a phenomenon called the overtraining reversal effect, and what the overtraining reversal effect is is that if you learn A not B, and you do it for, and you're a pigeon, and you do it for 20 trials, right, and then you learn B not A, it takes you quite a long time to do that. So just as just as you learned A not B, and now you have to learn B not A, and it takes a long time. If, on the other hand, you take a pigeon that's just learned A, not B, and you give it 50 trials, so you overtrain it, and it keeps on going A, not B, A, not B, A, not B, A, not B, or out into the wazoo, you might think that it would take them longer to reverse, but the opposite's the case. It actually reverses like that. And the idea, the proposal that Macintosh put forward was the overtraining reversal effect reflects the fact that at some point, it's not just A, not B, it's A-ishness that determines what's correct. Yeah, so it's learning something about not just that property of that stimulus, but that class of property of stimuli, and it starts paying attention to B. So initially it pays attention to A because A is rewarded, but now it pays attention to B as being in the class, but not, not rewarded, and therefore it, it can switch its attention to B because it, B is now become in this group. So that's part of the stimulus categorization <coughs> process. So. Looking back, for example, at the first data I showed, the orbital lesion data, where the reversal deficit caused a set formation impairment, but when you finally train them and train them and train them until they had a set, then they've got a set shifting impairment, which is probably also a set formation impairment, because if you can't form set, then you can't shift it either. 
because once you let go, you can't get a new one. Yeah? So, so it's going to look the same as a, as a set shifting impairment will, and, a, and a set formation impairment. If we could get these guys to finally get a set, they might have a set shifting impairment. That's not true, though, is it? Because modafinil didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Should have made it even worse. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. You you sort of this question a little bit about how many things that is. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna get into trouble for that one. I'm going into the lion's den here. <laughs> They invented modafinil, right? So the, the group I'm speaking to published the first paper on modafinil and schizophrenia. So you might imagine, <laughs> you might imagine that a cognitive answer under certain circumstances might be detrimental. Correct. So wouldn't it be better to talk about a cognitive normalizer rather than an answer? Because basically That's what we're trying to go for is a cognitive yeah. normalizer, not actually that's a good conclusion. That's a better. So what, what Eric's suggesting is that instead of talking about cognitive enhancement, I've finished the talk with a cognitive normaliser, which is actually more advantageous than going for a cognitive enhancement when we actually don't even know what it is we're trying to enhance. And one could imagine that enhancing in some contexts is actually impairing <coughs> in others, depending on the you know, sort of yerkes dodson like curve. So a cognitive normaliser. That's true. So all you normal guys out there, don't bother with modafinil. Yeah, that's a good conclusion. Your weirdos are fine. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> good. Well, it turns out we have a solution yeah. now. <laughs> so it's time to shift the set in for the... Um, thank you very much. The well, thank you very much indeed, Derek.